Fantastic. So Sreczko, finally, welcome. Uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation. We're very honored to have you here today. Uh, hello, everyone. And I'm also very happy to, to be here, even if it's digital, but <laughs> that's our reality these days. So I'd like to start because this workshop really, uh, the, the central topic that interests us is, is the relationship between speculative art and space and spatial issues. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with, with, with a very general sort of question. Uh, I was interested in, uh, so we look into speculative art as a possible way of seeking and realizing spatial justice. And uh, in the two of these two books, which I just shared uh, after the apocalypse and portrait from the future, uh, you discuss various issues of, of spatial injustice from commodification of space, refugee crisis, climate change, and so on. And very often you make reference <clears throat> to speculative genres, literature and film, uh, Handmaid's Tale uh, by Margaret Matwood, I'm just mentioning a few of them, Ballard, Terminal Beach, and so on. So I was interesting, how important was this speculative art aspect of art, of, of literature and film mostly important for you when you when you were you engaging with the problems you describe? Yeah, it's very important for me. I, I couldn't actually imagine uh, writing or thinking without this speculative moment. Uh, and I think given the situation today with uh, the accelerating climate crisis, the impending nuclear threat, COVID pandemics, earthquakes, volcanoes, and so on, uh, I think uh, we need some sort of speculative critical theory, to put it like that. I think that critical theory today, uh, which uh, attempts to analyze, uh, uh, criticize society or a political economy, and tries to bring up some solutions for creating a more equal, better world uh, and survival of species as such, uh, necessarily needs speculation. Uh, and here I'm very close to my dear friend and influential theorist of science fiction, Darko Suvin, uh, who also comes from Yugoslavia and uh, who in his book, The Metamorphosis of Science Fiction, uh, which was published, I think, uh, two years after Sex Pistols was singing No Future, in 1979, he published this book saying that science fiction operates through something what Bertolt Brecht called Verfremdungseffekt, uh, or what uh, Viktor Shklovsky called uh, Ostranjenja, which means that you need this kind of what Suvin calls cognitive estrangement uh, uh, in order uh, not just to grasp our current reality or dystopia, if you want, but also in order to create a sort of utopia. Uh, so in this sense, I think, especially today, uh, we need uh, uh, speculation, speculative practices, speculative critical theory, speculative art. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that today uh, you can see, you know, this kind of science fiction everywhere. And it's mainly dystopia if you just watch it. The recent blockbusters about space, for instance, space exploration. Uh, I don't know, this movie with uh, George Clooney, Midnight Sky or Wandering Earth, uh, the Chinese movie, which is on Netflix, or the most recent one, I think South Korean one, uh, Space Sweepers, uh, you will see a completely destroyed Earth uh, where the space is now presented as a new frontier uh, uh, for uh, basically for escape, uh, which also today, I don't know whether you saw it, Elon Musk was tweeting as usual, but today he was tweeting that uh, we need multi-planetary life uh, because uh, on Mars we might grow uh, vegetables or have animals which will die out on earth, uh, which also kind of shows that this kind of anti-utopian, dystopian thinking today is prevailing, that we cannot even imagine, uh, well, a different future, but uh, a future which resembles the future of capitalism itself, you know, where private companies, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, entrepreneurs and so on will, will, will own the commons, not just the commons in the sense of natural resources, but the commons in the sense of information, the commons of, of in the sense of emotions, desires, everything which is now being uh, privatized uh, by big tech and technology. Yeah, I see. Uh, just yeah, when funny that you mentioned Darko Sovin. Actually, I I talked to him the other day. I was mentioning um, I invited him to the workshop, and he said he was very sorry he couldn't come. But he said, "Oh, you're very very lucky to have Sreczko Horvat." So yeah, I'm I'm really <laughs> glad to hear. And and Darko just published some. The, I think everyone should read uh, the the recent text he published in the last two years about the pandemic. It's it's really good. Uh, yeah, and he needs a much much broader audience than just our bubble of you know spec speculative crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> Utopians, yeah, you're right. 
Uh, yeah, just when you mentioned the, the, the sort of proliferation of dystopian narratives and you're mentioning sci-fi, different films and literature, just earlier we had a, we had a panel where, where we were talking about that. Does that have perhaps the opposite sort of effect? You know, it's normally it's supposed to be subversive, these dystopian narratives are sort of warnings, but when it's become so sort of uh, also, to, I guess, through the view of, of, of mass culture and the... Uh, so do you think it has actually the opposite effect from, from being subversive? Yeah, today, I mean, maybe a few years ago, I would say the opposite uh, because I was also using in my writings or in my thinking on or my critical approach to our current reality. I was using uh, dystopian uh, literature or movies. Uh, but for instance, today, if you watch what I would say is a masterpiece by Alfonso Cuaron, Children of Men, uh, and compared to the situation in the United Kingdom today, I mean, it, it looks very similar. And then it's, it's a question whether this kind of genre, although I still think it's a masterpiece and we should rewatch it and rewatch it, because every time I watch it, I find new moments which are you know, either about the refugee crisis or infertility, which is now also becoming news and headlines and so on. Uh, but the, the, the question is, you pose it right, whether it still has a sub subversive uh, potential, you know, because the reality already, uh, uh, transposed, the, the reality accelerated so much. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic, although that's mainly in the news these days, but about other, uh, other developments in our reality. Uh, it accelerated so much that it's a question whether this kind of genre can still be subversive. So I think the most subversive thing today would be actually a utopia. Uh, but the problem with utopian thinking or utopian writing, of course, is that it's very difficult to write and to avoid not to be naive. So it's much easier to, to, to write uh, science fiction, which is criticizing uh, uh, our current society by imagining a future uh, uh, which accelerates from our dystopian present, like Handmaid's Tale or something. Uh, but I think the truly subversive thing today would be to, to create a world, a universe in which, of course, fictional one, uh, uh, in which uh, different uh, developments could be imagined or realized, which actually create a different future. I don't know a recent book which I have read is by Yanis Varoufakis, uh, who is known as an economist, but he wrote this science fiction book, which is called Another Now, uh, uh, with a very interesting uh, uh, starting point that uh, with the financial crisis 2007-2008, reality went, uh, reality actually became two parallel realities. And uh, one reality is our own world, and the other world is what would have happened if we have had used the financial crisis of 2007-2008 in order to create a sort of post-capitalism. And then, I mean, the, the greatness of the book is that it's actually a writer who really understands economy, so he, he provides alternative visions, uh, uh, not so much of our future, but uh, uh, concrete examples how the economy or society could function already today. And I think we need this kind of utopian thinking today. It's not just enough to criticize, uh, to make this kind of referendum or uh, estrangement, uh, and then in order to, to understand our reality, uh, but we also need to aspire to change reality as such. Yeah, I guess, and when you mentioned Yanis, yeah, I haven't read the book and thanks for the mm -hmm. tip, uh, but when you mentioned Yanis Rofakis is an economist writing from a speculative point of view, I guess there is a sort of dialectics between, you know, the, the, the real and the imaginative, the sort of, so I guess, I guess uh, the, the most subversive would be to bring those two together. And I really think you, you uh, your book sort of has that, I was really, I found it so interesting that for, for instance, Poetry from the Future, you start, started as a sort of autobiographical book. I mean, you, you're describing you being at the island of Vis. Then you go into the speculative, then you go back to the past of the partisan struggle on the, on the so I find this engagement really, really interesting with the real events, with the speculative and also personal sort of subjective experience. Uh, so I was thinking now to switch, we'll go back to the speculative, I guess, but now just to switch to the spatial perspective. So whenever you in both books, actually, you, you, you visit a lot of places, either uh, physically or in, in imagination, I guess now you're probably, it's only in imagination since COVID-19. So um, tourist, uh, tourist destinations you know, on the Croatian coast, uh, big European cities, disaster, uh, site of Chernobyl and so on. So how was how how important was this spatial perspective this rootedness sort of in space important for you because i have a feeling you when you discuss a particular topic you discuss it from a certain place and very often through the story and history of mm -hmm. that place itself yeah it was very important i mean i 
at the beginning, I must say that I always try to connect both the spatial perspective and the temporal perspective. So it's not just moving around places uh, in the present, in the geography, but it's also moving around, uh, moving from one historical event to the other and then connecting it to the present. Uh, but specifically about the spatial perspective, uh, I think it was in 2007 that I published uh, my first book, uh, uh, which was called uh, Znakovi Postmodernograda. Uh, yeah, I know. It, and it's unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> just published in Croatian. Uh, and uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm getting old. But anyhow, I was always interested in that spatial perspective uh, because I think uh, uh, through analyzing a particular space, we can come from the concrete to the universal, or we can actually detect the concrete universal by, by, by analyzing different spaces, for instance, from gentrification, uh, refugee camps, uh, uh, or a, a society of surveillance. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sufficient to look at the COVID-19 crisis uh, and investigate, compare different places in the world. Uh, uh, and out of that, we can really, through this comparative analysis, get to, to a better understanding of reality, which then, of course, is connected to the temporal, because sometimes some places are already in the future, like uh, China was, in a way, already in the future uh, when it started, uh, whether it started or not, I have no fucking clue, and I'm not interested in the conspiracy theories, but let's say it started in Wuhan. At that time, that was the future. You know, we in other parts of the world were still scrolling, doom scrolling, as they call it today, uh, which also shows this kind of a modification of the apocalypse, you know, that we constantly, before going to sleep, scroll constantly and think this is still something happening there. But actually what was happening in China was our own future. So I think this kind of uh, connection between the spa spatial perspective and the temporal perspective is very important. And for me personally, well, I would say that before it was kind of uh, natural because for the last 10 years I was mainly traveling all around the world, uh, leading really a kind of nomadic lifestyle. So, of course, this kind of uh, uh, experiences or concrete examples come into come back into the book. Uh, but, well, as you said, for the last year, I, I, I didn't exit my own country, which is kind of claustrophobic. But, well, we, yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more or less. So, yeah. When you mentioned temporality already, I really want to go back to that uh, later, because I feel we sort of, that's the thing that we overlooked at this workshop, really, because we were so, uh, so space oriented. But uh, yeah, just when you said, I really like the point in your book that the apocalypse has actually already happened. And you give several examples of uh, how actually this decentering of the both spatial and temporal view can, can actually you know, give us an insight to our own future. I really like it. And I, it really sort of, I must admit, it really helped me because both uh, myself and Ashley, the co-organizer, when we were, you know, planning everything, we were constantly falling into the trap of Eurocentrism, even though yeah. I'm not, I'm in Serbia, which is not really the Europe, what we mean by Europe when I say Europe, but we still were. So just, um, yeah, I guess this is really a common just to say that was, for me, it was very, very, very important point. But do you think it's, it's, possible actually to gain such perspective when we are so exposed to you know the media and propaganda which is very sort of western oriented and and eurocentric and yeah, def maybe mm -hmm. spe speculative can help there i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely i mean uh well today we still live in a very eurocentric uh, or western centric universe uh, uh so i think there have been works uh uh recently also dealing with apocalypse uh, claiming that the apocalypse already happened in the sense of uh, colonialism, in the sense of uh, genocide, which is not even called genocide yet. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm talking about the uh, annihilation of, of, of the indigenous populations of, of the Americas, but also other, other parts of, of the world. I mean, this is still not acknowledged. Uh, although yet last year we could have seen, for instance, the smashing of monuments. Uh, we started in, I think, in Bristol, right? Uh, I think it was Bristol and then later everywhere, and it was connected to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think here you can sh see also how the speculative is important, actually, because this kind of resistance functions first, uh, not first, but uh, at that moment when they were smashing the monuments as a resistance towards, uh, towards signs themselves. Uh, you know, uh, uh, signs in the sense of uh, uh, symbols of colonialism, which were destroyed and in that way also I think a kind of verfremdungs effect maybe happened to those 
white citizens uh, 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 who are inheriting the colonial past of Britain or other countries, who maybe some of them for the first time understood, oh, look at this monument actually, who is this and why is he still here, you know, and he's a slave owner. Or if you go to Brussels, I mean, they could still have monuments to King Leopold II. And uh, we know today that uh, he, he slaughtered uh, around 10 million people. And it's pretty not natural, it's normalized. Uh, even when you go around your cities, just look at the uh, signs or the names of the streets. Uh, you know, I mean, you from Serbia uh, uh, know that very well, as I know from Croatia, uh, what happened after the destruction of Yugoslavia and the bloody war, you know, you had this kind of historical revisionism where the street names were changed and everything which was connected to the anti-fascist past was changed into the new symbols of the new era and so on. Uh, and I think, you know, we constantly have to understand this, that this is a process of normalization where we don't ask questions anymore about something which is portrayed to be normal. Uh, which again then would bring us also to the COVID-19 crisis and in which way it served as an accelerator of the normalization of, of the digitalization of life, the zoomification of life, remote learning, remote workshops, uh, uh, and remote everything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, I just wanted to ask actually, um, now that you mentioned normalization and you say that it's it's actually covering up the disaster and that it's the opposite from revelation or unveiling, which is for you the true meaning of the, of the I mean, that's how you, you, you like to approach the concept of apocalypse. So, and by apocalypse, as you write in the book, so now I'm talking about uh, after the apocalypse, obviously, uh, you say it's not a single catastrophic event that will sort of mark the end of the world as we know it, but uh, you call it eschatological tipping points. And you actually emphasize that these are the things that have been happening for quite some time already. So nothing really unexpected, but, uh, you say that whereas the apocalypse is doom saying, or what we mentioned earlier, this proliferation of apocalyptic narratives leads to, uh, and you described it as uh, either fetishist denial or apocalyptic fetishism. Uh, but you say that apocalypse, when understood as revelation, can actually be inspiring. So um, can you can you please elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I must say that I was very influenced for writing after the apocalypse uh, by, I would say, one of the most underestimated philosophers of the 20th century, uh, Günther Anders, uh, who was, uh, well, a German slash Austrian philosopher who is maybe uh, more known for being the husband of uh, Hannah Arendt uh, after Heidegger. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, then they escaped together to Paris uh, uh, during Hitler and uh, later moved to the United States. They were not together anymore. Uh, but if you follow this thinking of Günther Anders from the 40s and then later, uh, you will see that uh, he's probably uh, one of the philosophers who came closest to understand uh, uh, the meaning of the apocalypse. Uh, uh, of course, he started by exploring Auschwitz uh, uh, and the Holocaust, uh, but uh, 1945 was for him the year which kind of uh, signified uh, a change in the epochality, a change that in the sense that we are reaching a new epoch, and this new epoch is the last epoch. As long as it can last, whether it's 20 years or 100 years, uh, uh, well, we are not that uh, optimistic anymore, or whether it might last 1,000 years, it's still the last epoch. And for Günther Anders, it is the last epoch because in 1945, Hiroshima happened. And when Hiroshima happened, it means that uh, 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 the whole world, the universality was in question, uh, uh, and uh, that we entered a nuclear, nuclear age, which will never disappear because we are unable to unlearn uh, uh, the technological capabilities which we learn to create the atomic bomb. And well, you could have seen later that he was right. Uh, Harrisburg, Chernobyl, Fukushima, the Marshall Islands, the nuclear tests which happened on the islands of the Pacific Oceans, which some of them are still taking place, uh, 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 and the nuclear race which is still taking place. Uh, and what you can see here, and here I come to the Marshall Islands, uh, is that what we have today, I think it's even uh, more revelatory in the sense the apocalypse revelated, unleashed itself even more uh, than in the 20th century. Is the, it is the collision between nuclear age and climate change. So if you look at the Marshall Islands, so that was, it's probably the most nuked place on planet Earth. I don't know whether it's in the universe because we don't know whether aliens also uh, uh, do this silly, uh, tragic, uh, catastrophic things, uh, uh, but it's definitely the most nuked place uh, on planet Earth. 
uh, because of all the United States nuclear tests. At the same time, the islands are, well, I wouldn't say sinking, but the sea levels are rising and you have radioactive contamination going into the seas. Or take a recent example, a few days ago uh, uh, from Japan, Fukushima, that uh, they plan, which they are actually doing all the time, but now it was news again, uh, to, to, to pull the, 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 the radioactive uh, waste and contaminated uh, uh, materials into the ocean. Uh, so I think by this, the, the, the very ontolo ontology is changing. It's something we, which we cannot even understand. This is why Gunther Anders uh, talks about the supraliminal, not the subliminal, but the supraliminal in the sense something which is much bigger than we can even uh, 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 concept conceptualize. Uh, so in that sense, I think the apocalypse already happened. Uh, uh, a revelation about extinction, a revelation that uh, uh, I wouldn't say the human species, I'm critical of the term Anthropocene, uh, but a very special system which was created by humans uh, would be able to uh, not only destroy uh, the planet as we know it, but also the biosphere, the semiosphere and other species. And I think this revelation already happened and more and more people are aware that this is happening. Uh, uh, but we still have something what Anders uh, calls apocalypse blindheit, uh, uh, the, the blindness towards the apocalypse, the apocalyptic blindness. It is so big, it is so supraliminal that we cannot even uh, understand it anymore. Or on the other hand, as we could have seen, well, this year, uh, we are so much uh, immersed into our concrete reality, which is, of course, char characterized by a pandemic, by austerity, uh, uh, by uh, protests, by anger, by frustration, by impotence and so on, that we cannot, cannot really reach out and, and see the big picture. And I think this is a big problem because we are losing the long-term perspective, but we are also losing the perspective of universality, something which is planetary. Yeah, I was just going to ask, and yeah, just to comment on Gunther Anders. Uh, indeed, yeah. when you said underrated, I, I truly discovered him through your book. <laughs> so, I'm um, glad. <laughs> yeah, I find it. Uh, I mean, uh, and when you say, when you when you mentioned his concept of the, the 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 last epoch, is it, and that we cannot unlearn the things we have learned, but then again, I find it uh, kind of uh, important this idea of, as you said, decentering in both time and space, and I. I now I'm referring maybe more to the poetry from the future, but there you, you, you insist on this idea of poetry and the future as a complete novelty and creation. But you also sort of draw inspiration from, from a partisan struggle from the past. Here you, are, you're, you can see that you're really inspired by Gunther Anders, who was writing in the 50s about nuclear threats, but you're using this sort of knowledge and this perspective today. So... Um, yeah, I was just, just interested in this sort of opposition between the novelty and the past. I mean, you insist that uh, sort of uh, we have to be progressive, but then again, you really refer to the past very often. So I was just interested in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very critical of the term progress, uh, uh, although I'm part of something which is called the Progressive International, uh, which is an internationalist movement, which is uh, really taking place uh, all across the world, uniting trade unions, movements, uh, 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 grassroots movements, and so on. Uh, but I think, and in this case, it's more a tactical decision because progressive today covers, of course, a, a, a bigger umbrella, uh, which can then, politically speaking, include the left, the Greens, uh, perhaps, I hope, the anarchists, uh, and many different others uh, uh, who I think should work together for creating this kind of poetry from the future. Uh, and when I speak about the poetry from the future, of course, it comes from Karl Marx, who said that, uh, not only said, he analyzed actually in which way uh, different political movements were always inspired by the past, instead of, as he says, drawing the poetry from the future. And you can see it today in many movements, you know, many so-called leftist movement today actually uh, uh, advocate something which in the 20th century would be called uh, good old social democracy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't think it's uh, really radical to just continue speaking about progressive taxation, uh, distribution of wealth, uh, or for instance, to advocate just electric cars because supposedly we will go green uh, without questioning uh, where does the lithium come from? Uh, uh, what about the coups, uh, uh, coup d'etats uh, in different Latin American countries? What about deep sea mining where the lithium also uh, uh, comes from and so on? Uh, so I think, you know, th this is meaningless unless we also speak about class struggle. Uh, so, and in order to speak about class struggle, I think we cannot escape from the past because 
uh, uh, what uh, we are trying to accomplish today, even if some of these ideas in some cases resemble social democracy, which of course today would sound as a utopia, although I think we need to go much more beyond, uh, I think uh, it is necessary to look at the past and to analyze it, but also to be inspired by what I call the un unfulfilled potentialities of the past. So for instance, in Poetry from the Future, I take uh, the island of Vis uh, in the midst of the Adriatic Sea as uh, kind of my spatial but also temporal perspective, uh, uh, where I try to show that this was a moment in the anti-fascist movement in Yugoslavia, which later also had other moments. It's interesting to look at the archipelago of the Adriatic Sea, uh, 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 where I would say you have at least three islands. Of course, there are many others, but three islands which, islands which could be understood as kind of uh, symbols, uh, a particular tem temporal spatial moments through which you can understand the history of Yugoslavia. Uh, and the first one is Vis. Uh, the second one is Koliotok, and the third one is Briuni. Uh, the first one is Vis, because that was the place uh, uh, which was uh, never occupied by the Nazis. Uh, uh, the local populations, thanks to the, uh, to the partisans, and then later also to, to, to the British allies, uh, mainly thanks to Fitzroy McLean, uh, 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 succeeded to kick out the fascists after the, uh, after the uh, defeat of Mussolini. Uh, and it was an island which was free and where not only the, the foreign policy of Yugoslavia was being formed, uh, uh, but it was also at the same time the kind of laying foundations for the later uh, federative system of Yugoslavia. Then, of course, uh, only a few years later, you have another island, which is Goliotok, uh, the so-called naked island, and it's called naked because there is nothing on the island. Uh, uh, it's a sort of what Günther Anders would call naked apocalypse, not the apocalypse, because uh, it was an island where there was nothing, but they, they brought uh, uh, the Stalinist, but also so-called Stalinist enemies of the regime uh, who were there in a sort of Stalinist, which is the irony, uh, 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 Stalinist uh, concentration camp. And I think this is something which uh, uh, the Yugoslav nomenclatura didn't really uh, uh, confront themselves, which later then, the later generations, even now in 2021, uh, have to respond uh, when the right-wing uh, 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 extremists or the or you know or the Ustasha or the Chetniks today say yeah what, but what about this concentration camp? Uh, so for instance, also from looking at this island, we could understand a lot uh, about socialist Yugoslavia and also different aspects of that system. And then of course in the end there is the Briuni Island uh, 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 where there is a beautiful zoo, not anymore. Uh, but which served as this kind of luxury space uh, for, for Tito uh, and uh, the nomenclatura uh, who were living this kind of luxury lifestyle with uh, Hollywood stars coming, smoking Cuban cigars and so on. Although we also have to admit that it was also an island where the non-aligned movement meetings took place. So at the same time, and that's the contradiction of, of Yugoslavia, I would say at the same time at one island, Briuni, for instance, uh, you have uh, very important internationalist politics, which, me, which we miss today under the name of the non-aligned movement, which uh, uh, this year, I think, uh, will have uh, an anniversary uh, from 1961 to 2021. Uh, uh, but at the same time, it also shows the contradictions, complexities of the socialist system. So I think in that sense, we can learn from this history, and I just named Yugoslav history, I could name any other history, uh, uh, Haitian history, or the Haitian revolution, uh, we can learn from this kind of events in order to also construct a different future. But I think what is important is not to try to translate, not to try to repeat, replicate uh, something which happened in the past. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I think what we also need, and then I shut up, uh, is um, this uh, deconstruction, destruction of linear time. Uh, uh, deconstruction. That was my next, next question, so you can yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah. No, 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 please just ask and we can, we can uh, continue speaking yeah, about first that. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's very important to be critical of the past. I mean, the way you, you really describe in the book, especially about the um, Yugoslav struggle, about the non-aligned movement, to, to learn the mistakes, uh, but also to keep what is, but I guess, and especially when you give the uh, the, the example of Briuni, which is, which is really fully commodified island today, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's, uh, how do we, I mean, yeah, where do we seek this memory and also in our two countries at least it's you know the sort of dominant narratives very easily erase this this memory of the past yeah i think we need to and the next question is about um, linear time yeah sorry <laughs> yeah yeah to this question i mean just just quickly i think we have the duty 
to investigate our own past, as difficult as it is. I mean, in our, in, in our geography, of course, uh, uh, we had a kind of erasure of memory. Uh, just in Croatia, Croatia I think, uh, during the, the, the bloody war of the 90s, around 3,000, I don't know the, the, the exact number, but I think it's around 3,000 anti-fascist monuments were destroyed. <laughs> so uh, 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 practically meaning that means if a child is going through a city and there is no monument anymore, uh, uh, the child wouldn't even be aware that at this place there was either a positive uh, 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 historical event that took place or a dystopian uh, uh, historical event that, that took place. Uh, for instance, in, in Poetry from the Future, I write about, which I really like, this kind of decentralized monument, uh, the Stolperstein uh, in, in Germany, you know, which is not just in Germany now, it's, the, it's, it's basically the biggest uh, uh, decentralized monument uh, on the planet, I would say. Uh, it's not this obelisk which keeps appearing, you know, but it's Stolperstein. There are millions of them all over the place from Poland, Germany, Austria, even Croatia, uh, which are put at the exact place where someone was uh, uh, forced uh, uh, to the concentration camp with a name, with the years and with the name of the concentration camp. And I think this, this is something what I try to do in my theoretical work as well, like to ground it into something which is very concrete, but out of this concrete, you are coming to the to the universal and you see that you're just part of a historical process which is still taking place yeah yeah and when talking about universal again i'm going back really this time to time uh, mm -hmm. your engagement with not really with time as as we were just speaking you know past and the future but temporality itself and you really insist on this idea i mean because usually when we talk about the liberation of space uh, which is occupied by global capitalism sometimes literally we we talk about sort of reappropriation of built built spaces urban spaces uh, spaces of nature and so on but you suggested very clearly that along with this reinvention of space, we also need to think about reinvention of time and to abolish the notion of time as uh, of linear, linear chronos, uh, time of capitalist progress and expansion. So if you can explain a little bit about that, I really love the Pomelo philosophy of, of this. Yeah, I don't know how many will understand it, but uh, it's also very difficult to understand it. But when you come to, to, to the Mediterranean islands, uh, you you come to understand the Pomelo philosophy quickly, quickly, I would say. I mean, it's the most closest equivalent of Festina Lente, uh, which is also something which we need today. I mean, in the Zapatistas, you have a similar philosophy of time, uh, uh, because I think the problem today is that we are colonized by this kind of capitalist time, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, is not something new. I mean, Jacques Le Goff, for instance, was writing about uh, this uh, change which happened uh, uh, both with the invention of the mechanical clock and the industrial revolution, uh, where quite literally the clocks on the towers of churches, uh, 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 their function would be turned instead of calling people uh, to pray, it would be turned to call the textile workers outside of the city uh, uh, and to, 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 to kind of uh, categorize time, the working time, and what is the time which is free time and so on. And basically this starts with capitalism a few centuries ago. What we have today, of course, is a hyper acceleration of this uh, uh, tem temporal colonization in the sense that we are constantly, especially now with COVID-19, uh, you know, living in a kind of uh, uh, present, uh, which, which is not a real present, but it's a kind of presentism, you know, this, and even the social media is a nice reflection of that because in social media, you can see that uh, first you could uh, write a long status on post on Facebook, it was many letters, then you had Twitter with a few letters, and then today, of course, you have TikTok, which is just a very short video. So you can see also that the social media reflects this kind of reduction of the attention span, but at the same time, uh, reduction of our temporality to pure presentism. So we are constantly in the present, unable uh, to look far ahead into the future because we are either uh, 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 hypnotized uh, uh, by, 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 by the current news or so on, uh, uh, but at the same time, we also lose this kind of historical perspective because of this colonization of time. And I think, you know, historically, it was connected, of course, uh, uh, to the process of uh, dividing the, the planet of Earth into meridians, uh, the invention of the mechanical clock, uh, uh, and everything which had to be categorized. And then, of course, you have Benjamin Franklin, uh, who said that time is money. So you already have this kind of turning everything into, into, into a mean to, to accumulate more money. And uh, of course, for that, you need time. Uh, 
uh, uh, but I think what we have to do today is a kind of subversion in order to subvert this linear conception of time, uh, uh, which is also a capitalist notion of time, which is right history in the sense of time, which goes from, I don't know, uh, 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 from ancient Greece, for instance, if we speak about the history of philosophy, which of course is very Eurocentric, uh, but in classical philosophy books, uh, you will always go back to ancient history. Maybe they will mention some uh, Asians, maybe Buddha or something, but basically only Europe invented philosophy and it goes back there. And then it's linear and has this kind of uh, uh, movement from one point to the other point. And usually also history or politics is understood like that. You know, very often I'm being asked, for instance, this question whether Occupy Wall Street or the so-called Arab Spring and so on, whether, uh, uh, whether these movements fail. And then, of course, each time you have to respond saying that they didn't fail, you know, of course, if you think about Occupy Wall Street as something which uh, uh, was supposed uh, to bring down Wall Street, well, perhaps maybe it failed, but the, 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 the kind of objective is pretty, pretty ambitious. Uh, but it didn't fail because I think in some, uh, uh, first of all, because historically it was connected to other struggles in time and in space. In space, for instance, to Tahrir, in time, for instance, maybe even to the Spanish Civil War, uh, when it comes to the anarchist characteristics of Occupy Wall Street, but it's also connected to a future uh, where I think if there wasn't Occupy Wall Street, you would hardly imagine uh, AOC today or uh, uh, this huge movement uh, for abolishing student debt, uh, which was kind of originated from Occupy Wall Street. So in that sense, I think this kind of perspective uh, enables us to, to also get rid, overcome a kind of uh, what Benjamin called left-wing melancholia, uh, you know, sticking to our past, failures, which we understand as failures, and then we, uh, in a kind of fetishism, stick to them because that enables us to, 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 to live in this kind of uh, present uh, without changing really the conditions of the present itself and the reality itself. Yeah, and then you, you, you mentioned a few examples, so I guess this being one of them, the island of Vis of heterotopias, but some of them are really uh, institutional, uh, uh, intentional communities like some comunitat, I think, in, in mm -hmm. Catalonia. Uh, so I guess also there you say that uh, as well for Foucault, who, who he introduced the concept of heterotopia, for him it's not only a different space, but also different temporality. So I guess my question is, if these this different temporality outside of this uh, linear capitalist time, if it still exists on, on some islands, if, if they still exist within the capitalist system, I don't know. How can we sort of, you know, bring into, uh, if possible, maybe it's not, to, to a bigger scale, can we, can we seek inspiration from them and in what way, really, I mean? Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't romanticize. I mean, that's, that's, that's very often a, a big problem to romanticize uh, uh, semi or autonomous communities or islands and it's I, I'm the victim of it as well uh, uh, or the perpetrator or as well of uh, a kind of romanticization of the Mediterranean I admit uh, uh, and it's very difficult to to resist that temptation because uh, well if you come to a Mediterranean island I'm not just speaking now about Croatia but also about Greece and my understanding of course of the Mediterranean is much broader both in the spa spatial perspective but also in the temporal perspective uh, um, much closer to Fernand Brodel or Predrag Matvejevic for instance who understood the Mediterranean as something which covers a very big region and covers uh, a few thousand years uh, uh, and I think in this space and in this region and in these thousands of years you could have found uh, uh, many examples of heterotopias uh, for instance uh, even before pre-Socratic philosophy uh, uh, in uh, Minor Asia, uh, uh, you had uh, something what was called isonomia. Uh, the Japanese philosopher Kojin Karatani has a beautiful, important book about it called Isonomia, uh, which is a critique of democracy as well, and especially critique of Athenian democracy, showing that before Athens, this birthplace of so-called democracy, which of, which of course was a democracy without slaves, women, and foreigners based on expansion, colonialism, extraction, exploitation, and so on. Uh, but that, be that outside of that space, you had islands uh, which were functioning on the principle of cosmopolitanism, uh, where you know citizenship wasn't necessarily connected uh, to where you have been born, but you could move freely from island to island. Uh, then, of course, if you go, would go back to the future, to the fascist period, uh, somewhere I found, I don't know whether in Gramsci or somewhere else, uh, that the fascists in the 40s had an idea of a 
a confederation of Mediterranean islands, uh, uh, which I find very interesting. Uh, uh, of course, they had a dystopian imagination in place, which would be a fascist confederation. But I think this makes more and more sense, especially given the, the, the accelerating climate crisis and that the ge geography as, and geology, geology as we know today uh, uh, will radically be transformed. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Arctic is melting already so quickly that new transport routes are being uh, uh, opened, uh, which again means that the world can, of course, uh, go to hell, but we will continue with uh, the accumulation of capital and the transmission of capital. Uh, but you can find this kind of places uh, in poetry from the future i write about more utopian places like uh, communes or cooperatives in uh, catalonia and spain or some other examples uh, i mean i i even think that a protest uh, as much as critical i can be of the manifestation or, or the form of classical protest i think also a protest a demonstration uh, can be and usually is a, a heterotopia uh, because you create a space which is not a utopia but it is per foucault's definition a place which exists uh, 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 at the same time as these other places. Uh, so I think, yes, we can create these kind of places. We must create these kind of places. These kind of places exist, uh, uh, but we shouldn't over romanticize them uh, uh, because I think uh, uh, our challenges and our uh, threats are so planetary today uh, that uh, these kind of uh, heterotopias uh, have to be interconnected. I mean, they can serve as a kind of tool uh, but also real existing reality uh, for, for a future which wouldn't be built in the future, but which is being built now, you know. So instead of uh, speaking about getting rid of money, uh, uh, you can actually get rid of money in a community which would function uh, uh, through a different uh, system. And I'm not talking about cryptocurrencies now, but uh, uh, a system without money, for instance, as much as difficult it is uh, to imagine today. Yeah. Um, thanks. I have loads of questions left, but uh, I see we only have some 14 minutes. So I'd like to ask the audience, the panelists, if you have any questions. I see something in the Q&A. Um, Sreczko, if you were to write a purely utopian novel, what would you center your topping around? Uh, moreover, how would you avoid pitfalls such as nativity that you already mentioned and the fact that one person utopia can be another person's dystopia? <laughs> Yeah, it's a tricky question in the end. Uh, uh, but I don't know, I would probably take an island utopia or islands utopia going the direction of uh, uh, imagining or showing in which way uh, you can create a concrete, maybe not utopia, heterotopia on an island and in which way this island would be related to other islands. But well, I'm, I'm not a writer. Who knows? Uh, but uh, uh, if I would write something, it would be something like that, I think. But what I really like, perhaps I would also, I mean, it's the first time that I'm answering to this kind of question, which, which I like. Uh, uh, I would probably also go in the direction of this temporal, so spatial perspective, probably island, uh, temporal perspective, I don't know, 20, 50 millions of years or something like that. I mean, that's the reason why, I, why I'm not writing such a thing. It would be very difficult. But if you read, for instance, the free body problem or Ch recent Chinese uh, uh, science fiction, you will see that they have this kind of long term perspective, uh, uh, which I think is so important. And for me, the island of Viz actually enables this perspective because the very island was created uh, by an underwater volcano 220 million years ago. And uh, you can still see some of the effects of this volcano on the beaches, if you know how to look and so on, stones, uh, uh, petrified lava and so on. Uh, and it kind of gives me hope, you know, if you have this past catastrophe in front of yourself. Uh, I mean, it's also not really hopeful. It's also kind of ironic that uh, actually fossil fuels wouldn't exist without a massive previous catastrophe. Uh, uh, and now fossil fuels are leading to another catastrophe. But anyhow, I'm not sure whether I answered the question. I know there was a second part, but um, I don't know. Maybe we go to other questions and then. Yeah, I how would you? Back. Yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, we can. Yes, Martin, you, you raise your hand. Feel free to uh, turn on your mic if if the big brother. Uh, it would be great. Yeah. To, yeah, it would be great to see you when you pose the question. It, it makes this a bit less alienating. <laughs> oh, so. Thanks very much for that. That was really um, thought provoking. I was thinking whether you had any thoughts on, I'm thinking of Andreas Malm's recent provocation about violence 
and uh, rioting. And I was wondering if you uh, had any thoughts on the place of violence uh, when it comes to protest or I, I guess the climate emergency and at what point, like how, how you think about violence and maybe mom's provocation. I don't know if you, uh, how familiar you, you are with it. Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Well, I, I really, uh, let me just put full screen. I, sorry. Zoom will kill us all. Wait a second. I, I just you disappeared. Uh, anyhow, it's it looks weird now, but I I have small screen. So anyhow, yeah, I I, I respect Malm a lot. I find his writing uh, uh, from fossil capitalism to the most recent book, which I didn't read yet, to be completely honest. Uh, 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 I find it very inspiring, and I can see some similar contradictions uh, which I myself have. You know that on the one hand you advocate. Uh, uh, I, well, I wouldn't call it what Rudy Duchka calls it, long march through the institutions, but you advocate uh, a fight which can also take uh, uh, electoral uh, uh, realization, like in the sense of electoral politics or changing the system from within or changing mayor, major planetary institutions uh, into doing some good. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think this is sufficient or this is enough because, again, it brings us back to the traps of the past, uh, which we could have seen precisely with Duchka and that, that generation uh, uh, which went in that direction from 68, you know, through the system. On the other hand, if you take 68, Germany, uh, 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 you have two other directions. One direction is RAF, Rotterme Fraktion Terrorism, violence, and what this violence created. Although I also respect some of those people a lot. I have some former RAF friends uh, who would be very critical of me, what I'm doing today, I guess, uh, in the sense of trying to... Uh, 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 come to peace within this contradiction that I think it's able and it's necessary to work within the system against the system, but it's also necessary to create spaces outside of the system. Uh, I think this is this kind of contradiction which we all have to live. And I think it's not either or, I think it's both. Uh, uh, it's both communism and anarchism, I would say at the same time, I don't know. Uh, uh, but definitely what I think Malm is contributing to, to, to the discussion is, uh, uh, well, putting the discussion of violence in front of us because it's a taboo. It's not just Malm, Brad Evans, for instance, uh, uh, had some beautiful works on, on important works on violence and dialogues, I think include in Los Angeles Review of Times, I think including with Malm, uh, uh, where you can see that violence is definitely a taboo. Uh, violence of those who protest against the violence of the system. <laughs> so it's very cynical. So in that sense, I think I've been also saying for years now that there is nothing more violent than the system itself. Uh, and if an activist from uh, Extinction Rebellion blocks a train, I mean, what is this violence compared uh, uh, to, to all the trains uh, which are part of the capitalist accumulation and contribute uh, to, to climate change? Uh, so I'm a very peaceful person, but I don't think that we should dismiss violence as such. I think we should uh, rethink it deeper. I don't have much time now to go much deeper into it, but I think uh, uh, we shouldn't shy away from, from a theoretical reflection on violence and uh, we shouldn't easily dismiss concrete examples of violence as something which is, well, just a pure frustration of, of someone. Uh, of course, one last point, I think the problem with uh, uh, violent protests uh, or violent action in the way we have it today is that most often it actually provokes an even and that the RAF or Brigata Rosa lesson, it provokes an even uh, uh, bigger violence of the system itself. So it provokes more surveillance, it provokes a state of exception and so on. Uh, but honestly thinking, I don't think that this current crisis which we have will be resolved without violence. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the very crisis itself is already so violent uh, uh, it's enough to look at COVID and which countries got vaccinated and what about the global south, which is not, which will not get vaccinated uh, until 2023. It's enough to look who are the biggest victims of climate crisis and so on, that you can see that this violence is happening every day. Uh, someone doesn't have to shoot, you know, to kick you in the, in the face in order to be violent. Uh, you have this kind of uh, structural violence, which is the biggest problem, I think. And if people resist or themselves show violence against this system from time to time, who can blame them? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to speak as a activist now, but I cannot mm. help myself. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And indeed, you're free to speak as an activist. <laughs> uh, so do we, yeah, perhaps we have uh, time for one more question. If there's anyone um, 
Yeah, I don't see panelists actually. So if someone has raised their hand, Ashley, maybe you can tell me. Or also for the attendees, feel free to post questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'm gonna continue with one. Try to cherry pick one of my yeah unanswered questions. Yeah, I I can, uh, nobody has raised their hand, but can I pose a question if if that's okay? Of course. Um, just when you sure. talk about your your activism, I'd love to ask you a question about your activism, um, and you can take it as generally or as specific as you'd wish, but like. Is there an idea of the apocalypse you have in your mind when you're thinking about your own activism? Like, for example, does an idea of the end of the world or some great catastrophe either kind of motivate your own activism or hinder it in certain ways? Or do you have to tweak your idea of apocalypse or catastrophe when it comes to being an activist? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thanks for the question. And thanks, Martin, for staying. I can at least see four people on the screen now. <laughs> I know, I mean, I, I, if I was in your place, I, will, I would also shut down my, uh, my, my, my screen and I wouldn't have a face here. So I fully understand the others. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, oh, someone appeared. Uh, uh, so nice to see you, but don't be pressurized. Don't be pressurized <laughs> no. to put your now. Now too many people. You call them I'm out. Like, you embarrass them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, it's nice to see you. Uh, uh, so um, yes, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine my activism without without uh, without the apocalypse. Maybe before I wasn't so aware of it, but since mm -hmm. I approached the topic in a ther theoretical framework, uh, uh, you slowly start to understand that, uh, of course, it's not enough to to think about the apocalypse uh, in just a theoretical way, uh, but you. you each and every one of us has a personal relation to this uh, event, whether it's the revelation of COVID, the revelation of extinction, the revelation of, of climate crisis, uh, uh, or the nuclear threat. Uh, so for instance, what worries me during the last past years is definitely not just so much climate crisis, because you see that uh, uh, finally there is a public debate about climate crisis, which of course is trying to be subverted by green capitalism itself, uh, which is kind of saying, yeah, yeah, fine, you want electric cars, here come the electric cars and so on, as if this was a radical change. Uh, uh, but uh, what you can see is that these kind of events uh, uh, radically transform ourselves as persons as well, as persons as well. So I think what we have to do is to try to relate to it in a, in a well, in the real life. Uh, uh, and one of these apocalyptic threats or tipping points as eschatological tipping points is definitely what we can see now in front of us. Uh, this is this never ending zoomification of life as just one concrete universality of in which direction uh, the development of technology is going uh, 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 in, in the sense of uh, this hyper integration, which was now accelerated by COVID uh, into what I don't know, Shoshana Zubov might, might call surveillance capitalism or some others might call techno-feudalism. I'm not happy with any of these terms completely, but I think they slightly describe in which direction we are going. And that's definitely a revelation as well of COVID, uh, uh, which at the same time accelerated this technological shift. I mean, just look at what's happening with Bitcoin or non-fungible tokens, uh, in which way art is being digitalized now today. Uh, uh, capitalized sold for millions and so on. Although you also have some good examples, for instance, and that's a good example. You know, you see the digital apocalypse, uh, but you can subvert it. For instance, yesterday Snowden succeeded to fundraise more than five million dollars uh, with uh, a non-fungible token. <laughs> so that that's kind of inspiring. Let's see in which direction it goes, because you could have seen also Clubhouse, which started as this kind of posh whatever uh, uh, thing, but now you know everyone is going uh, clubhouse and so on. But these are just, you know, characteristics of, I would say, this technological revolution, uh, which is changing our own subjectivity. And then, of course, in your real life, if there is anything like a real life anymore, uh, you can decide how, man how many hours you will, be, you will spend on Zoom or whether you will use another platform uh, uh, or whether it is still possible to escape the digitalization for modification of, uh, uh, of our social bonds, of communication itself. And then just to finish with this point, uh, another threat which I'm trying to relate to in my activism, to put it like that, is, of course, the nuclear threat. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, of course, a bit too young to, to, to remember Hiroshima, uh, uh, but I remember Chernobyl. I mean, I was still a kid in Munich, but I kind of still remember it. And it was an event which uh, 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 also changed the course of history. The, the problem is that today among uh, global activists, uh, uh, the nuclear threat is not really a topic. 
you know, uh, uh, it's not really something people are talking about or, you know, unlike in Günther Anders' times, you had the anti-nuclear movement uh, pretty huge in Germany, for instance, in France, in other countries. Uh, but today there is nothing similar, except maybe I just have it here promoting a book of a friend. Uh, this is amazing, uh, uh, A Radiation Revolution, which is a book about Fukushima uh, from a kind of anarchist point of view, which uh, shows that after Fukushima in Japan, they created all sorts of heterotopias, uh, you know, DIY radiation meters, uh, 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 sharing information uh, and so on. So that actually there is an anti-nuclear movement today, but I wouldn't say that it's global it's definitely not planetary in the sense of the climate movement, you know, represented by Greta, Fridays for Future, and so on. So I think that's something what I'm trying to, to contribute to in a modest way today, because it's, it's a huge topic and huge threat. Yeah, well, there we go. It's three o'clock uh, European, Central European time, two o'clock Dublin time. So um, I guess we'll have to wrap it up, uh, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, thanks, Rachko, for this really, really inspiring talk. Uh, thanks to, to everyone who attended and um, yes, uh, we have our next panel coming. So for people who are coming, use a break. And thanks, Rajko, again. I hope you, you enjoyed yeah, it. Thanks to everyone. I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed you made my afternoon. Uh, now I can enjoy my weekend. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but I have some family obligations now, but uh, so I won't be able to stay. But I'm really looking forward to, to watch uh, some of the, I hope, all i cannot watch all but most of the speeches because i find the topics quite interesting and if someone can send wants to send me fuck what did they do Aha, if someone wants to send me their text or something i'll just put my email in the in the chat so just feel free to contact me perfect, perfect. yep Thank thanks you. a lot thanks, thank you Bye. Bye.